associate with First Letter and a former member of Clean Lakes Alliance Friends Board and a current Founders Council member. Along with hosting partner, the Edgewater, production partner, the University of Wisconsin Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, media partner, the Isthmus, and supporting sponsor, Dotson Bank, First Weber is once again proud to be presenting sponsor of Yahara Lakes 101 Lake Science Cafe. Thank you to the 29 organizations that have become Clean Lakes Alliance Lake Partners last month. Your support is greatly appreciated. I have a few announcements. First, our annual Save Our Lakes breakfast at the Monona Terrace is less than a month away on Wednesday, May 2nd. There's information in front of you on how to sponsor a table or buy a seat. There are student, government, and nonprofit discounts available. Be sure to attend this year. We'll be updating our phosphorus reduction progress for the past year, as well as the unveiling of the winner of the $10,000 reimagining Warner Park design contest. And we will be showcasing all of our designs. I've seen them, they're incredible. Also, Citizen Lake monitors have begun picking up their equipment for the monitoring season to start in early May. Thank you to all who are participating. Make sure to check your lakeforecast.org and watch our weekly uh, weekend lake reports on Facebook before heading out onto our lakes this summer. I know the ice is gone and piers are going in, so we're ready for our summer season. If you aren't already a friend of Clean Lakes, please consider making a donation and join today. Starting at just $35, friends attend all of these talks for free, as well as help us meet, meet our $1 million annual campaign fundraising goal, which will help fund important lake projects, education, and monitoring. In addition, Late yesterday afternoon, Dane County's Healthy Lakes, Healthy Farms Task Force met. This force includes James Ty and members of our committees and community board. The group discussed possible recommendations to reduce phosphorus runoff in agriculture. This task force plans to conclude its work in the fall of this year. This month's Yahara Lakes 101 is sponsored by Alliant Energy. Alliant has been a great partner to the Clean Lakes Alliance for a number of years. Here to tell us more about their involvement with Clean Lakes, as well as this month's topic and speaker is the Executive Director of the Alliant Energy Foundation, Julie Bauer. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Mary Lee. So, as Marley mentioned, Alliant Energy has been a proud partner, sponsor of Clean Lakes Alliance for quite a few years. I can remember when James came to my office and, and brought this idea, and we were pretty excited about it. So, it's great to be here with all of you today. Um, we not only have the honor of sponsoring this month's the Era of Lakes 101, but we've helped support other community events. Um, throughout the years aimed at raising attention, raising awareness around um, those important issues with lake projects. As part of our commitment to the environment, um, we do many different things, but today's focus is around water, and we're going to learn about aquatic hitchhikers. These invasive outsiders to our lakes can damage our economy, our ecosystems, and our way of life. So what we are going to do, or so what are we doing to prevent the spread of these invaders and stop them from showing up in our lakes altogether? So we're going to learn about this. And today, um, Susan Graham, a lakes coordinator for the Department of Natural Resources here, um, she has a master's degree in waters resource management from the UW-Madison Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, and has worked on a variety of lake-related issues for over the last 25 years. Her projects include water quality assessment, coordinating the statewide citizen lake monitoring network, and serving on committees to establish phosphorus standards for lakes. She currently works on the aquatic plant management along with monitoring grants and policy for lakes and aquatic invasive species. Susan is an avid gardener and hiker and loves swimming and paddling when there isn't ice coating our waters. And lately, that's kind of an uh, issue, huh? Um, please join me in welcoming Susan. Good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation 
Julie, I really appreciate it. Um, and um, happy to be here today with you all. Thank you for coming. Um, I think we'll just go ahead and jump right in. Um, I'll be sharing with you today the subject of how Wisconsin prevents the spread of aquatic invasive species. Um, we have uh, programs that do research. We have programs that control invasive species. But we all know that prevention is the least expensive and most effective way to, to deal with, um, with the problem. Um, Wisconsin's aquatic invasive species programs are supported by the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership. Recognized as a national model of collaboration, the partnership works cooperatively to support our lakes. The DNR supplies technical expertise and regulatory authority. University of Wisconsin Extension provides educational materials and programs. And the citizen branch of the partnership consists of lake groups and their parent organization, Wisconsin Lakes, which serves as a voice for concerned citizens. The citizen branch also includes nonprofit lake groups, friends groups, and just regular individuals who love lakes. Today, I'm going to define the problem of aquatic invasive species and provide some background information and some examples of some interesting species and situations. I'll tell you uh, about the partnerships AIS programs. AIS is what the acronym I use for aquatic invasive species. And then ways that you can help prevent the spread of invasive species. So you might be familiar with invasive species and the problems they cause. Um, aquatic invasive species, or AIS, are non-native plants, animals, or pathogens that can cause economic, environmental, or recreational harm, or affect human health in some cases. Um, by aquatic, we mean that they live in lakes, or near lakes, or streams, or wetlands. And um, this photo shows uh, a, a plant, a vine, called Japanese hop. And you can see it's completely taken over the riparian corridor in, in this spot on, uh, in, in Grant County. Um, and you can see the kind of uh, like suppression of native plants that this can cause. It also has very shallow roots. So when water, we have a serious rain event, water is going to come gushing down this stream corridor. And it's going to rip out the roots and, and erode really badly. Um, so invasive plants and animals cause a lot of damage um, in, in their natural environment. They have predators or they have diseases, but when they move someplace new where they're not native, those predators or other controls aren't there. So they can uh, grow quickly, uh, reproduce very quickly, and they can take over. So why do we care? It, it, this bears repeating because it's so important. Um, aquatic invasive species cause economic, ecological, or recreational impacts. And some, like zebra mussels, do all three. Um, depending on which species we're talking about, the control, or the, the sorry, the cost to control them um, or cope with them can be extremely high. Um, <clears throat> The, the environmental harm is uh, demonstrated by how they can attach onto our native clams, and the clams can't open to feed, so survival becomes very difficult for our native clams. Recreation is harmed because they can encrust on boats that are left in the water, and in fact, if you have a boat that you keep moored in the Madison Lakes, or any other lake that has zebra mussels, you're probably going to need a boat lift um, to keep your, your boat out of the water. And as you came in on the registration table, there are some blue uh, tri-fold pamphlets that tell you how to protect your boat in your motor. Um, pretty much says drain the water out of your motor every, after every time that you use it and don't leave your boat moored in the water. Um, there's some kind of paint that repels zebra mussels too that you might be able to paint the hull of your boat to protect it. Um, and then, you know, other recreational harm. Uh, these boulders were had been lifted out of Lake Wisconsin. Lake Wisconsin has zebra mussels, and the shells are very sharp, but you can very easily imagine that is not a friendly 
surface of the lake bottom to walk on. There's going to be a boon in the sale of water shoes in, in Madison because that's what you need to do to protect your feet. And also, if you're lifting piers in and out of the water or lifting up a boat or something, you're going to need leather gloves if there's zebra mussels that are firmly attached um, because they'll cut your hands. So let's touch on a few other aquatic invasive species that have become established in the Yangara Lakes. Milfoil showed up in Lake Mendota in 1962 and has spread from there. Uh, the early spread in Wisconsin was uh, very clearly following the highways in Wisconsin. So that was one indication that we knew people were moving it around. Um, it uh, almost never occurs in lakes without boat landings. So that's an indication that uh, people will say, oh, birds can spread it. It's like, yes, they can, but it's a lot less likely than uh, the people who are taking boats out of, out of lakes and then it's caught underneath their boats or caught on their trailers and uh, moved from lake to lake. Um, another major introduction was discovered by our own Center for Limnology in Lake Mendota in 2009. You may know about the spiny water fleas. Uh, they've taken off here, and so far they've resulted in a loss in clarity of Lake Mendota's water by about a meter um, because of its effects on eating other zooplankton. So food, food web uh, effects of invasive species are no joke. That's a big difference caused by one species that was introduced here. Um, they can change a lot of related lake features like clarity, nutrient cycling, and fisheries. Um, research by the Center for Limnology has found that monitoring for this species is most effectively done by uh, co collecting uh, sediment samples off the bottom of the lake at, at the deep area and looking for those spiny tails, which um, are uh, largely made of silica. They don't degrade quickly and they can be found in the bottom sediments. So we used to look in the water for them. And now we're realizing that you can look any time of year by taking a sediment sample and looking in the sediment so that you can find the tails to, if they are present. Um, so that, you know, by monitoring it helps us um, uh, make sure that they aren't being spread, make sure that people are aware that they are present in a lake. They can also spread if somebody pulls up an anchor um, from their, uh, you know, when they're anchored in the lake and the anchor has mud on it, the, the mud can contain the, the resting eggs of the spiny water flea. And then they go to the next lake and they put the anchor in and you've just introduced uh, uh, potentially viable eggs into the new lake. So cleaning off our anchors is another important thing to keep in mind if you're moving from lake to lake. So more recently, uh, zebra mussels were found here, again by the Center for Limnology, who's out on the lakes quite a bit. Um, in their second year, female zebra mussels can release up to a million eggs in the water. Um, that is nothing. The males can release more than 200 million sperm into the water where fertilization takes place. It kind of gives you an idea of just the crazy reproductive uh, potential of uh, this species. The fertilized eggs develop into free-swimming larvae called villagers, which can be transported over long distances by water currents. And within two to three weeks, the villagers begin to settle out in the water under the weight of their forming shells and attach to firm underwater surfaces like rocks, sticks, plants, piers, crayfish, of last, as of last fall, they've moved downstream and they are now established in Monona, Wabisa, and Lake Kaganza. So we don't need to hear reports from your friends or neighbors down on the lower lakes. We know that they're established there, um, unfortunately. The, the maps I've been showing show, um, it, it may be a little difficult to see this lighting, but it shows uh, all the locations where, where these species are found. There's a lot of lakes, by the way, that don't have milfoil or zebra mussels. So our work to protect those lakes is still ongoing and very important. 
Viral hemorrhagic septicemia is called VHS for short. Um, it's a, a fish disease that was uh, found in European freshwater trout since the 1930s. And the virus was first diagnosed in Lake Superior in 2005 here in Wisconsin. It can kill more than 25 different fish species, but there's no danger to humans who handle the fish or eat the fish. Um, it's just that it kills fish. Um, we don't know how the virus arrived in Wisconsin. It might have been part of like, or like already infecting fish that swam up the, um, the, the canals from the Atlantic coast, or it might have been in the ballast water of, uh, of the large ships um, that, that are ocean going. One good thing about uh, VH has, I mean, it's a small good thing, but you're always looking for something good, right? Um, the publicity that accompanied the, the uh, VHS allowed us to get our message of prevention out to um, it may be an audience that we might not have otherwise reached. And the fact that it hasn't spread more widely in Wisconsin yet kind of gives us hope that um, it, it can be kept out of most of Wisconsin's lakes and rivers where it could pose a, a serious threat to our fisheries. Speaking of threats, let's take a look at some potential future invaders that aren't here yet. Um, you may have noticed the handout by the door that looks like this one. It shows photos of some of the more worrisome potential invasives. And it would be great if you would look it over at your leisure and get to know some of these species. So when you, if you or when you ever like travel or see them anywhere, um, you'll be familiar with what they look like. Um, starry stonewort is a macroalgae, or a large algae that looks like a regular flowering plant. It's similar to cara or muscograss, if you're familiar with that aquatic plant. Um, <clears throat> it smells kind of skunky. If, if uh, you've fished in other lakes, you might be familiar with cara. Um, this algae doesn't have that skunky smell, but it's related to cara. And it's been found in a, a handful of lakes in southeastern Wisconsin. And we're pretty concerned about it because we don't have an effective method of controlling it uh, once it gets established. We'd love to keep this one out of more lakes. Um, <clears throat> this is a really interesting species, the yellow floating heart. Um, it's a southern um, flowering plant with a very pretty uh, yellow flower in a small floating leaf, kind of like a water lily, but just much smaller. Um, we've had a few instances of yellow floating heart in Wisconsin. Um, a couple of pond systems in southeastern Wisconsin had it, and we tried to eradicate it by using herbicide, and I think that six different herbicides or combinations of herbicides that were recommended by the best um, herbicide experts in the country failed to kill the plant. So what they ended up doing um, is they ended up uh, cleaning, like draining the pond, removing the, the vinyl or rubber liner to the pond, like rolling it all up and lifting it out with a crane, putting in a new liner, and basically rebuilding the whole pond. And we were able to successfully get rid of the yellow floating part that way. Right now, it's currently found in a small private pond north of Madison. It's not connected to any water. But we are, um, we're evaluating options for effective control of that pond. May have to rebuild that pond, I don't know. Also widespread in the southern United States is water lettuce. Um, this is a really attractive and soft plant. Like when you touch it, it's a little bit fuzzy and it's very nice to, to handle, uh, Katie knows. Um, it reproduces vegetatively very quickly by a small shoot off the mother plant. So if, okay, so we have a mother plant and off of the side of it, you can see like little stems that go to another plant. And so it reproduces kind of at a logarithmic scale. So it grows very fast and it can create dense mats that will smother um, native plants. And you know, in places where it gets super dense and like is covering the water, it can actually result in uh, reduced dissolved oxygen in the water. 
Um, it also produces some viable seeds. And that is really what worries us because while the plants are really vulnerable to freezing, like the lightest first frost of the year, they're just brown and they die. But if there, if there are viable seeds that fall into an area that stays warm, like a spring, that water never freezes. And we're a little bit worried that it could come back the next year. Um, in fact, that's what happened in pool, I think it was pool five of Lake Onalaska um, on the Mississippi River. That's where this photo was taken. The water lettuce returned after, for, okay, it was found in one year. It was all removed by hand. The next year, and then winter came, everything was killed, and the next year it was there again. So that really makes us worry that it could overwinter here if, if it finds the right situation. I'm going to go off on an interesting side story about this plant um, because it's local. Um, it's a quick overview of a situation that occurred um, here in Lake Mendota two years ago. Um, a passerby uh, first sighted uh, some water lettuce at the, the blue dot on the map um, and, and reported it. They took photos and they called the DNR and said, I found water lettuce in Lake Mendota, did you know? And I said, no, where was it? And we verified the identity of the plant. We went out and surveyed all the nearby ponds and all over Lake Mendota. This is in University Bay in the southwest corner of Lake Mendota with Willow Creek here at the bottom, there's Willow Creek. Um, and then we made a plan uh, very quickly because we did not want a windstorm to come that would blow these plants around the lake. So we, we just, we had to be very quick. We called Clean Lakes Alliance. Katie came out with us. We called the Hoofers uh, Outing Club and we got a bunch of DNR staff from the downtown office and our, our Fitchburg office. And uh, we went out and um, collected the plants by hand into canoes and kayaks because um, there's a lot of plants down there and you really can't be motoring around very easily. And um, we searched um, all the way north to the tip of Picnic Point and east. We found a single plant at the University Rowing Club building under that plant was like under a pier. And then um, and then we went as far as, as uh, Tenney Park um, looking for stray plants and no more were found. So we think that we got them all, but you can see how small they are. And they're kind of like hiding in the edges of the reed canary grass, hiding under the lotus leaves. Um, and we wanted to find, our goal was complete eradication to make sure that there were no viable seeds produced. So here's some pictures of the collection effort and the team. Then this is some of the people on one day. Uh, we think we pulled out about 400 pounds of water lettuce. And we believe that it was released into the lake by a well-meaning garden owner who was just uninformed that that is not how you're supposed to get rid of your um, unwanted plants or pets. People will do that sometimes. So we think that's where they came from. So that was a success story. But back to some other uh, future threats. I wanted to mention that invasives can be plants, algae, snails, viruses, or fish. Um, so I wanted to give an example of a fish that we're, we're kind of keeping an eye on. Uh, the round goby is established in some waters near Green Bay and Lake Superior. And these guys steal bait and they can outcompete native fish. So they're a nuisance for anglers. Um, and they also hurt the native fisheries. So we all care about them. Um, the DNR is asking anglers to keep their eyes out for the round goby. And uh, the fish has some very like interesting uh, features. Normally, fish on their bellies, they'll have two little fins that's called a pelvic fin. And in the round goby, they're fused, so it kind of becomes a single circular fin on their belly. Um, and if, if somebody sees a fused fin, please let us know, because we need to find out you know, right away if, if um, this species is found in, uh, in, in, in a lake. So we can try to prevent them from moving to other lakes. So how do invasive species get here? Um, we call the transfer of invasive species to Wisconsin or 
among lakes in Wisconsin, um, we call those vectors. So that's the ways that they move around, our vectors or pathways. Um, there's a variety of activities that, that uh, humans do that facilitate the transfer. And shipping in, in animals moving around in ballast water is the number one way that animals are getting to Wisconsin. Um, there's also introductional, or sorry, uh, intentional introduction of, or stocking where people think it's a good idea to put something new in a lake because that's like a species that they think would be good. Um, that, that is completely illegal to do, um, but, but it's done. Um, the nursery industry, um, people release things by accident, the aquaculture trade. So the, the common theme of all these major primary pathways is that they're facilitated by people. These are not ducks that are flying from lake to lake that are moving things around. It's humans. Secondary pathways are once an invasive species is here, how does it move around between waters? Um, the species can hitch a ride on recreational uh, boats and trailers, and that is the number one secondary pathway. Um, uh, scuba divers can move things inadvertently. Um, in fact, there's a, let's see, there's a, um, a quarry in southeastern Wisconsin in Racine County. The only people who visit that quarry are scuba divers because that's what it's used for. Um, it's not used by anglers, it's not used really by anybody else, and they got zebra mussels. So we know, we believe that's evidence that scuba divers probably were the ones that transferred zebra mussels um, by accident to that lake. Um, so the, the pathways are important because that gives us clues on how do we interfere with that transmission. So that gets us to the meat of, the, of our talk today, which is uh, prevention and how do we prevent these invasive species from moving around. Um, at the foundation of our prevention efforts in 2009, the Wisconsin legislature um, adopted a rule called NR40, it's a Wisconsin Administrative Code. Um, this is the most comprehensive law of its kind in the country. Um, it, it's not the strongest law, but it's very broad um, because um, it's a preventative rule aimed largely at statewide and industry-wide education about invasives. It identifies a couple of classes of plants that are like invasive plants. We call them restricted or prohibited species, and I'll talk a little bit about what those are next. Um, and there's a, you can see that they're yellow and, and red or kind of orangish and red. Um, that would indicate like caution or full stop. Those colors are found on that handout of the invasive species in the back. Um, some are restricted and they're yellow, some are prohibited and they're circled with red. So what are restricted species? Um, these are ones that are already here. Uh, it includes uh, uh, zebra mussels, um, there's garlic mustard you might be familiar with, um, Chinese mystery snails, curly leaf pond, weeded yellow iris. Um, these are all invasives that are classified as restricted. Um, they're, they're believed to have environmental or economic impacts. Um, our goal with these species is to contain them. We know they're here, we can't eradicate them, but we don't want them to spread. So um, if somebody has one of these species, they're encouraged to control them. Um, you can't transport, transfer, or introduce these to new locations. But elevated a level is what is prohibited. Prohibited species, you, uh, they're not here yet, or if they are, they're in very, very small numbers. Um, they do pose a significant risk to our environment and our economy. Um, early detection is critical because we want to eradicate these, and that's our goal, is to try to completely eliminate the plant or the animal. Um, and if somebody reports one of these species, whoever owns that water body, they are required by law to get rid of it. Um, can't have it can't possess it. Um, 
And then, but although if you are a researcher or if you're bringing us a species and saying, look, I found something, here it is in a bag, that transporter possession is allowed because we're just trying to identify it. So there's a waiver in the law that says you can possess these species um, for those reasons. We've got some um, water lettuce. That's how concerned we are. Yellow floating heart, uh, water hyacinth. Um, that's a red swamp crayfish is the red crayfish. Um, I'll talk more about crayfish in a few minutes. So in addition to defining the status of invasive species, NR40 makes it illegal to transport plants hanging off of boats and trailers. And it's illegal to transport water away from lakes. So um, those are the, the two ways that we feel are the most important ways to restrict the spread of invasive species. There's pictures of plants hanging off a trailer and somebody properly emptying out their their day bucket. Um, also, if you go to boat landings anywhere in the state, we're trying to get a sign like this big invasive species uh, prevention, it's the law. We're hoping that one of those signs is at every single boat landing in the state. So that's our goal. They, they do get vandalized a lot or get you know knocked over and they need to get put up again. So there's a maintenance factor involved, but we want people to remember to clean off their boats and trailers and drain their water. So the law is uh, enforced by DNR um, with what we call stepped enforcement, focusing first on education. Our goal isn't to get people in trouble or to issue fines or citations. Our goal is to get people to comply with the law. Um, and you know, if there's problems with the education, if somebody has got a bad attitude and you know, or refuses to comply with the law after they've been informed, then the enforcement escalates. If you were to go to the NR40 website, and if you have interest in this subject, I really encourage it, because I think it's a really great website with a lot of interesting things. You would see a page that looks like this. And if you were to click on the species list, you can browse around as you want, but the species list will take you to places where you can see um, the regulated species listed. You can see maps of where they're located in Wisconsin if they're here already. Fact sheets for each species that are like quick and easy and you know very interesting to read. Um, literature reviews and evaluations of the reasons why they're regulated. Like what is the risk to the economic damage um, in Wisconsin? And in addition to the NR40 law, I'll cover some other programs that work to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. This is a list of the programs I'll touch on very quickly. Um, first, we want to make sure that with our work, monitoring lots and lots of lakes all summer long, um, or the work that the DNR has authority to permit, like say aquatic plant management, or somebody out there with a big machine and they're removing a dam or something like that. We want to make sure the work we permit or the work we do isn't spreading invasive species. So we did a thorough literature review um, to try to determine the best way to decontaminate all of our equipment, our gear, our boats, our machines um, when we move between waters to make sure that we're not the ones who are, you know, spreading invasive species with our work. We probably have been in the past before we were really aware of invasive species. Um, so each species of plant, animal, or pathogen has methods of decontamination that work best. Um, some succumb readily to a mild bleach solution. If it's wet for 10 minutes and then rinsed off, you don't have that species attached to your uh, felt sole boots anymore. Um, or if hot, uh, hot water is needed, over 140 degrees, that might kill something. Some other things have to have either stronger chemicals or they have to be frozen. Um, it, it's a real challenge. We wish there was a single way that would get rid of everything, and there isn't. It's just life is not that convenient. Um, so cleaning our, our gear and our boats is something that, I mean, like I said, it wasn't done when I first started working at DNR, but then the more we learned about invasive species, and the more we realized that we could be carrying this stuff around, 
work has changed. Now, the, the, the view on the right of um, my coworker um, using a high pressure hot water sprayer on our boat, that's a, a daily view that in behind my office. We have to do this every time we move boats between waters. We aren't as, uh, we don't have such strong uh, standards for um, our advice to the public, however, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, th there's times where prevention of invasive species overlaps with um, uh, monitoring, for example, or it can overlap with research. Um, citizen monitoring of our lakes is where it overlaps with monitoring. Um, we partner with River Alliance of Wisconsin. You may be familiar with that organization. They have a program called uh, Riverine Early Detection, or Project Red for short. Um, we host a snapshot day where people get together, you know, families and friends will come to a boat landing and they'll learn about invasive species, they'll go out and monitor and then they'll come back and we'll talk about what data they found. They'll, they'll, it, basically all these things raise awareness. Um, and the gentleman on the right is, um, he's using a secchi disc at the moment to measure water clarity, but our citizen lake monitoring network, um, the, the DNR program, has people looking for aquatic invasive species also. Um, so there's lots of ways for caring citizens to get involved in aquatic invasive species prevention. And all these activities raise awareness and then people, you know, foster a connection with lakes and streams. Clean Boats, Clean Waters program. This is really, was the genesis of this talk was Katie called and said, hey, can you come talk about the Clean Boats, Clean Waters program? And I said, you bet, I'd love to. Um, this is where either volunteers or paid staff come to uh, bo boat landings on their local lakes, and then they ask boaters who are launching their boats or coming off the lake um, if, if uh, they are familiar with the law. Um, do they clean off the plants off their boat before they launch? Um, they, they really, we just want to um, make sure that this habit um, becomes as regular and as routine as brushing our teeth every day. Should just be something that you do, just like keeping an eye on your gas gauge when you're driving. It's just something you gotta do. Um, so outside of Minnesota, we're the only state that does watercraft inspections using survey questions. So when you're approached at a boat landing by Clean, clean Boats, Clean Waters um, uh, staff or volunteer, they're always carrying um, a clipboard and they'll ask you a few questions. Um, and those questions um, help us know where people are moving to and from with their boats. Um, and it helps us evaluate the program. Like what can we do to make uh, people's behavior better to reduce the spread of aquatic invasive species. Um, and I'll just give a quick, under, uh, quick uh, example. Is uh, people weren't draining their water. They didn't understand that you couldn't leave the lake with water. Uh, from the lake. So we started a new program called the Drain Campaign. And that's where we would go to the boat landing, approach people with our clipboard and ask our questions, and then we would hand them an ice pack with the words uh, Drain Campaign or something like that on the ice pack. And we're trying to substitute behaviors. So to try to get people, instead of leaving the lake with their fish in a bucket of water, they would leave the fish, they would leave the lake with their fish in a small cooler on ice. Um, and that's an effective way to bring your fish home fresh um, without transferring water and, and breaking the law. So that's one of the improvements that we were able to implement based on the questions that we asked. So the volunteers and staff at the Clean Boats, Clean Waters program, they help us achieve the, the main goals of the program, which is to educate people about the law and what they need to do, communicate that we can make a difference and collect data on behaviors and, and motivations to try to improve the program. So I, I just wanted to show a quick slide that shows um, the distribution of lakes that had Clean Boats, Clean Waters programs. Um, as of, I think this is as of 2012, it's a little old, but you get the idea. It's kind of spread out on lakes throughout the state. Um, the Yahara lakes are well represented. Um, and the reason why the Clean Boats, Clean Waters program works is because all the different invasive species that are most common here 
can all be prevented by removing plants off of boats and trailers and spilling out your water. So I, I just wanted to maybe uh, give you a quick feel for the pressure of invasive species um, in Dane County. This is, uh, you don't need to read every lake, there's like 45 lakes listed on the left column. And across the, the, the top uh, column, there's different invasive species. This is a list of the lakes in 2011 that Dane County Clean Boats Clean Waters found people had transferred their lake from within five days. So there's a lot of lakes with a lot of invasive species that people had just come from. And that is a potential for infection of our lakes. Um, so it's a little bit alarming. This is the number of Clean Boats Clean Waters uh, people that have been talked to in Dane County. You can see we're really working hard through our grants program to reach a lot of people. We're trying to change behavior. That's really all we're trying to do. And we have a variety of techniques that are shown to change behavior. We also, I'll speed it up, Katie gave me a 10 minute uh, timer here. We have an organisms and trade program where we are working with like pet shops and internet sales where people get inspected and make sure that they're not selling illegal plants. Uh, we're trying to reduce the spread of these things. Um, ballast water has a high potential of bringing new things to Wisconsin. We, we have identified 32 um, high priority species that are would be viable inside the ballast water tanks. So if you've ever wondered what it looks like inside a ballast water tank, I have. I wonder what's in there. It's just a big open caverns where they store water and then you can see residual mud in the bottom. And a lot of these species can survive, like in their resting egg stage, can survive in that mud. Um, so we have an inspection program where we talk with the crews and the staff of these big ships about the importance of um, following best management practices and trying to reduce the invasives that can come in through their ships. So what can you do? There's a lot that people can do who care about invasive species. Um, First is know the law. Don't transfer water or lake plants. And we want you to share this information with your friends and family. Um, so the more people that are talking about invasives and are aware of them, the better. Um, you can support your lake group and you can volunteer. Um, volunteering is a great way to meet like-minded people and get out to enjoy fresh air and, and enjoy our resources. And most importantly, to make, make a difference in people's Volunteers' work really is appreciated. So while you're out near lakes and streams, um, make a habit of looking around carefully. Like pick up what's floating on the shore, or you know, when you're out in your boat and you see some plants, get to know what get, get to know those plants. And if you see something unusual, you can report it. Um, take clear, close photos. Um, collect a sample if you can. Just throw whatever you find into a Ziploc bag and stick it in the fridge in case it's needed. Um, you can email photos to the DNR or you can go online and um, search for Report AIS on the DNR website and it takes you to a place where there's forms to report something that you found something weird. And I just wanted to maybe give a couple very quick examples. Um, just a week ago, our fisheries people were out um, sampling Lake Wingra, and they found some big red crayfish that looked a lot like red swamp crayfish, which is a very bad invasive. And there's a photo of it on the left. Turns out it wasn't red swamp crayfish, thank goodness, but they look really similar to a white river crayfish, which is a native. So they were natives, we breathed a sigh of relief and we released the crayfish back into that same lake. But um, that was a bit of a panic because they hadn't seen something so big and so red before. And this little tiny plant in the middle is in Azala. This is the smallest fern on earth. Um, this was found in Crystal Lake a couple of years ago and we were not used to seeing this plant. I had never seen it and neither had all my co-workers. So we looked it up and we were really afraid that it was a Mexican variety that was an invasive. Um, because there was a lot of it. And so we took it to the herbarium to get um, microscopic identification of the reproductive structures. 
on the back side of those little leaflets and it wasn't an exotic. So that was another sigh of relief. Um, but that was a really interesting find that we had a couple of years ago. So if you see something unusual, photograph it, collect it, and report it. And call anybody. You don't have to call just me. You can call Dayton. You can call Clean Lakes Alliance. You can call Dayton County. You just call anybody, and it will eventually make its way to me or somebody that can um, look, look into it and figure out what, what we got. So I'll leave you with a quick quote from some social scientists, um, Doug McKenzie Moore and William Smith. They, they say that the major influence on our attitude and behaviors, it's not the media. It's people-to-people -people contact. It's talking with each other. And you know that is really kind of the heart of our aquatic invasive species prevention program is people-to-people -people contact. So thank you to a bunch of coworkers who provided um, help with my presentation, and thank you for being such a great audience. You take the questions uh, now. Yeah, right here. Uh, this is not necessarily a question, but a uh, observation. Um, last fall, zebra mussels appeared in uh, Lake La Vista, and we saw lots of them. Yeah. When I was taking out here. Yeah. This spring, now, just recently, hundreds and hundreds of um, scops, S C A U P S, mm -hmm. uh, have come and I think are eating the zebra mussel. Um, according to research I did, they like those and will go out of their way to, to eat them, mm -hmm. uh, and which is a good thing, I think, uh, because nature's taking care of nature. But uh, I don't know if it's a good thing for the spots if they eat all the all the zebra mussels and, and uh, you know and, and, and pick up all the, the the toxins that the zebra mussels have on. But I thought that's an interest because I've never seen hundreds of these birds yeah. before. Right. That's an interesting observation. The diving ducks do, are the natural predator for zebra mussels where they're native, I think in like Eastern Europe. But here, we have never seen them to be able to eat enough to control them. Um, There's a lot of them, and so I yeah. don't know if they can control them right. long term, but, but right. uh, maybe the spring will slow them down a little bit. Give them a Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Is the round goby? fish that eats the zebra mussels in Eastern Europe? Um, not sure. <laughs> it's possible. I, I think I've heard that there's only one native species that does eat zebras, mm -hmm. and it's a goby. Right. But I wonder if that's why we're seeing them. Right. Probably Is, the mussels. Yeah, I, I don't think that's why we're seeing them. We would only see the round gobies because we're bringing them here, and they're swimming upstream in places. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they could eat some, but they won't. They will not control them. Um, there's just too many zebra mussels here. We haven't seen any sign of control. Questions? Yeah, right here. Are there any kind of programs to encourage keeping uh, boat landings clear? One of the problems people have is pushing their trailer into a boat landing, and it's just full. And you can get most of the zebra off when you float out, but it's impossible to get the ones out that are actually trapped in the boat. Right. And uh, if there was a program to volunteer a dock or a boat landing or something like that, I don't know if you would be interested in that. Right. The, the comment is uh, asking whether or not there's programs that help clean up boat landings because they've become such a mess with plants and that just makes it really impossible not to get plants caught in your trailer. I don't think that there's any funding or any programs that are set up, but that same idea has occurred to people up north. Um, I've heard people at the Wisconsin Lakes Convention, which is actually happening next week, if people have nothing to do on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, they should come up to Stevens Point and come to the Lakes Convention. But I've heard there that people um, will develop their own little program on their lake um, so that's a really nice idea. It, it probably would help reduce the tra you know, the amount of plants that get caught on, on boats and trailers. Yeah, over here. Is there an example of the issue of plants that you successfully <clears throat> eradicated? Uh, no. The, the, 
there have been cases where they could get rid of it for a year or two, and that's when they caught it early and there was intensive management, but it always shows back up. We don't have really any examples, certainly not in Wisconsin, where it has been eradicated. So we don't use the word eradication much unless we really truly have a real hope of it working. It's a good question. ISIS in the back. Um, How many I, fines does the DNR issue per year was the question. Right. Um, I would say it's very few. Um, they, we, we started out um, when NR40 was passed um, with really focusing on education because if people don't know about the law, how can they be expected to follow it? But now as time is going by, they're becoming more and more um, inclined to more easily issue a fine, but I really think the number is quite few. Most people who care about our lakes are the ones who are using them and they want to protect the lakes. So I, I don't think that there's very many. Yeah. Paul? Um, another potential factor to that, that I'm aware of that people might um, be interested in is private sale and purchase of both of these. So yeah. um, you know, people have both of this and yeah. some of them. Right, that, that is an, another way. There's lots of ways things can move around and that probably is a, an important one. Yep, over here. I need to continue teaching the very youngest children like at Cherokee Marsh that, uh, that the, then they understand this whole bug, bee, water, wetland thing and they can get down to their parents comment was that our, our youth are a key audience for these kind of messages because then they talk to their parents. I couldn't agree more. Anybody else? No? Okay. All right. Thank you. I want to thank Susan again real quick uh, and all of our sponsors. I can use this. This helps. This helps. Hello. All right. And all of our sponsors for their continued support. Uh, be sure to join us next month, May 9th. Our talk will be from Karen Oberhauser from UW Arboretum. She will be talking to us about monarch butterflies, uh, which will be super cool. Also, we're going to be, oh, there we are. And that's her. There's a little butterfly. That's great. Uh, <clears throat> we're also going to be uh, awarding uh, our monitors who participated for the last five years at that uh, the RLX 101 next month. So be sure to join us. Also, if you are a monitor, and you haven't picked up your equipment, or you want to pick up your equipment? See me afterwards. See Katie. Well, I'll be in the hallway right by registration. And just one more thing again, if you haven't uh, signed up to come to our breakfast on May 2nd, I really encourage you, it's going to be a great program this year. We're going to announce the winners of our reimagining Warner Beach. We're going to talk about phosphorus numbers. You'll get a really nice Wisconsin-sourced breakfast, which is always fun. Uh, and that's at the Monona Terrace on May 2nd. So we hope to see you there. Thanks.